Hello, I'm Debbie Diamond, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Baroque violin and bow and introduce you to my instrument. Uh, this is my violin. The maker is Joseph Dallinger in 1770. Um, it's a very, it's a very uh, almost pregnant model, quite high in the middle. Uh, that was a particular style. There are some violins made like that, particularly uh, the Steiner violins. Um, it makes it very difficult to hold, and of course, Baroque violins we play without a chin rest. This is a leather chamois to protect the wood from, from my skin and to help stop it from slipping. Um, but I'm very lucky because when I was trying to buy a Baroque violin, I was living in Toronto, Canada, and there was actually only one instrument for sale in the entire city. And luckily for me, I fell in love with it and the price was right. Um, and I bought it from the, the man who also played it. So he was an instrument dealer, but he also played this particular Baroque violin. And so he built a little contraption here, which makes it easier to hold the violin and it stops it from slipping away. So that kind of catches under your jaw and then it's, it's easier to hold without a chin rest. It's different from a modern violin in several ways, some of which you can see, some of which you can't. Uh, the obvious difference is the strings. So I use uh, gut strings. Um, the, the G is is a gut core with metal on the outside. The D is solid gut, but if you can see, there's one strand of silver wound in with it. And the A and E are solid gut. Uh, that means that they're actually made from the guts, the intestines of animals, usually sheep. Uh, I, I tend not to think about that so much. Um, however, the legacy is that the gut strings are temperamental, like the animals they used to be. Uh, so they respond to changes in humidity, changes in temperature. Um, they're, they're more difficult to look after. They don't last as long. Um, we don't have any modern ways of tying them. We just do these, you know, very basic crude knots to keep them in place. And if you go to a Baroque concert, you'll probably hear strings go at some stage because they break very easily. Um, but we use them because it's authentic and because it's a different sound and it's a different action. So the feeling under your fingers and under the bow is completely different. And at the end of the day, it's about sound. What we're dealing with is sound. And so that's what, that's what we use. So a few years ago, I found myself in Sligo in Ireland uh, at a Baroque festival there, doing some performing and teaching. But then when the festival ended, I decided to go to a trad session at the local pub. And as luck would have it, it was one of those sessions where several national treasures were there. Um, and because I'd just come from a Baroque festival, I of course had my Baroque violin and my Baroque bow. Luckily, I was tuned up to 440, so I didn't have to worry about transposing. Um, and I just, joined in and started playing. And Kevin Burke was there and he was really interested in my violin. So I said, well, take the bow and have a go. And he played with my bow a little bit, but actually he didn't really like the bow very much. He, that, he said, no, that, that doesn't really interest me, but can I play your fiddle? I said, sure, here you go. And it was so interesting because his reaction was, wow, I haven't played on gut strings since I was 12. And my reaction to that was, ah, but when you were 12, you did play on gut strings, which I think is really interesting because this idea of metal strings is actually very recent. It's in the lifetimes of people today. So we have players who are active today who used gut when they were children because that's all there was. And when I first started playing Baroque violin, uh, 
my modern violin teacher at the time was Laurent Fenevich, who was a phenomenal teacher, and I'm sure many people watching this know, know his name. And when I played something on the Baroque violin at 415 pitch with the gut strings, his ears just perked up and he said, ah, yes, that's what it should sound like. So it was clearly resonating with his childhood memory of what a violin sounded like. Um, the angle of the bridge is different. It's hard to show this. I don't know. Maybe you can see that way. Um, it tends to be more flat, which makes it much easier to play chords, um, much easier than on a modern violin. Uh, the tailpiece is different. The angle of the neck is different. So a modern violin, the neck is much more of an angle like that. Um, which makes it easier to shift up high. So if you see someone playing a Baroque violin and shifting way up high, give them more sympathy because it is less physically comfortable. Um, but most of the music didn't require it, which is why the neck didn't develop at, to be at an angle until later on. The bow is really the, the, the most striking difference compared to a modern bow. Um, this is made by Louis Beget. He's a Canadian bow maker um, who makes excellent bows. And the, it's much lighter than a modern bow. Uh, it's, the action is very different. And the down bows are naturally stronger than the up bows. And that was part of the aesthetic. There was no equality. There was no equality in, in anything in life. No equality in music either. Um, and so the light up bows was part of the style and we use it to our advantage. Uh, whereas with a modern bow, it's much easier to play everything equally. The example that I'll be playing is the Allemand from Bach's second partita for solo violin. And I've chosen this because it illustrates the, how the light up bows really come in handy. There are lots of sections where we have three notes slurred and then one note. So it's one, two, three, and one, two, three, and. And on a modern bow, that's actually really awkward to do because the up bow should be non-stressed. It should be a light, weak note. But because we have three notes on a down bow, we need to then get back to the heel. And so on a Baroque bow, that's easy to do. But in a modern bow, it ends up sounding quite clunky. Um, so I thought I would illustrate how using the, the bow and the instrument that Bach would have been using in his time makes his music uh, technically easier, but it also gives it um, a musical meaning that's more accessible with, with this equipment. Thank mm -hmm. you. 